It is a delight to be with you here today, and I appreciate so much you spending a Saturday afternoon in a place like this studying a subject of such importance today. I want to ask a question as I begin. If there really is a God, as we heard so capably demonstrated in the last session, what next? Does he have anything that he wants me to do? And if so, how would I find that out? And how would I know it's really from him? And what's my obligation once I discover it? Now, to show you the importance of the revelation from God that we need, I want to ask you this important question. What would you think of this plan right here? Suppose I say to you, all right, uh, in order for the world to know what's right and what's wrong and what their purpose or meaning in life is, I would like to select 35 to 40 folks here today and to send you all off into a room somewhere, and you all put your heads together, and you decide what the rules are for living. Decide what it is that a man should do if he's a husband, or a woman should do if she's a wife. Tell us how children ought to act toward their parents, and tell us whether stealing is right or wrong, or uh, just come up with the rules for life, and every rule that you all come up with in that room, when you finish, come out, let us know, We'll type it all out on the internet, publish it to the world, and announce that everyone in the world is obligated to follow the rules that we came up with here in Jonesboro, Arkansas today with these 35 to 40 folks. What would you think of that plan? What would the world think of that plan? I'm sure the world would be saying, well, excuse me, but who do you all think you are? To go into a room somewhere and decide for yourselves what the entire universe has to do? Who made you God? Well, there we go. We get back to the very thing that we started with. If there is a God, if he communicated to us what he wants us to do, then it's a whole different matter. And he could have selected 35 to 40 men and inspired them and holy men of God could speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they could write it all down, and God could providentially preserve it, and bring us to this moment in time when you and I can read this book and figure out what we're doing here. And to show you the significance of owning a copy of this book, I want you to contrast this with the rest of the books that the world has written. In fact, uh, just take a trip to the bookstore with me as we begin this message. Let's go to the bookstore, a books a million, a Barnes and Noble, where there are stacks and stacks and stacks of books on shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf. So uh, we go into the store and the attendant comes over and we say, yes, here's what we want. We want you to take us to the one book in this whole store. We only want one. We don't want dozens of different books. Take us to the one book in your store that would definitively answer the following questions. We want to know how the world began, we want to know why the world began, and we want to know how the world's going to end. Could you take us, and by the way, one more thing, we want that book to be authored by someone that was actually there when the world did begin so that they could give us a first-hand perspective. What would the attendant look at you and say if you said, I want you to take me to the one book in this store that tells me exactly how the world began, why it began, and how it's all going to end, and I want it written by someone that was actually there when it all happened. What would he or she say to you? They might tell you, well, I'm sorry, sir, but we don't have any one book in this store that would answer all of those questions, especially from the vantage point of someone that was actually present when the world began. If they are secular-minded, they might not even think about the fact that there is a book. There is a book that tells you how the world began, tells you why the world began, and tells you how it's all going to end. And my assignment is to take phase two of this. Why did it begin? What is the purpose for our being here anyway? Now, I don't know if you've ever taken a philosophy class, 
but I've heard of more than one that had this question on a final exam with one question. The students come in for their final exam in Philosophy 101, and there's one question on their sheet of paper, their test paper. Why? Question mark. Start writing. Why? I heard someone describe such a test as this. They said they took this test and they said some of the students sat there puzzled for a while and then just wrote because and walked out. <laughs> Others wrote down why not and walked out. A number of folks left their page blank. They wrote nothing. They had no answers as to why. And some would philosophically think that to be the most enlightened answer of all is to suggest that you just cannot know the why. You're just trying to finally grasp the meaning of life and your meaning might be different than my meaning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so people meander through life and so many of these philosophers, you get to the end of their lives and you read of the bitterness and the misery and the hopelessness with which they faced the end of their existence on this planet. And I'm so grateful today that I've got a book that gives me some answers and I don't have to die hopelessly. I don't have to die in misery and bitterness and questioning what's next. In fact, in your Bible, in Colossians chapter 2, this is what the Apostle Paul would write about this subject in Colossians chapter 2 and beginning in verse number 8. He says, Now beware, lest any man spoil you, rob you literally, through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now the word philosophy in and of itself is not a bad word as long as the wisdom that you love is the right wisdom. The word philosophy is obviously a compound a form of Greek words that means a lover of wisdom. But what wisdom are we talking about? I want to take you to uh, a man that was wise in so many ways and yet looking for happiness in so many others. Uh, in some ways, his book is one of the best books on the, how philosophy alone without God in the equation leads to hopelessness. Go to the book of Ecclesiastes with me in your copy of God's Word and notice a man named Solomon. I thought to myself as I was driving here today, what if King Solomon were the lecturer today in my position? What if he were speaking in my spot? I would gladly have sat down to listen to the things that he wrote down in this book and the things that he could say, look, I've been there and I've done that. Solomon, what did you do to try to find meaning in your life? What did you think life was all about anyway? In Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 16, he writes this, I communed with mine own heart which interests me because this is the same author who wrote in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. But at this point in time in Solomon's life, there was a time in his life when he looked to himself for the answers. And you know, this creeps into our entertainment and our singing in the lyrics of our songs in America, even something that seems as innocent as uh, the Karate Kid movie from years ago, and I'm dating myself, I know, where the teacher, Mr. Miyagi, says, Daniel, son, the answers are all within you. And this is the idea that every problem you face in life, if you just look inside deeply enough, you'll find the answers and there is something in the idea of humanism that says up with man and down with God. And no wonder there is a, a, an attempt to get rid of God so that I can be in charge. In fact, some of the quotations that Brother Miller showed you here recently in the presentation reminded me of some others just like it that I'd read in which so many scientists and those who are evolutionists would say, look, the idea of spontaneous generation is clearly incredible, but uh, the, un the alternative is unthinkable in that special creation. We cannot allow ourselves to admit God because if God exists, then I'm not in charge. 
And I've got to be in charge. I don't want someone else telling me what to do or what not to do. I want to be in charge. As you read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is looking within himself for answers. I communed with mine own heart. Verse 16 of chapter 1. And what did you say about yourself, Solomon? I'm come to great estate. I've gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. I thought to myself today, someone might question my credentials educationally to speak at such a, a university and environment like this. I do have a master's, but that's as far as my education goes in the uh, world of the higher education. I've done a lot of study of this book on my own, and I certainly would love to learn more and keep trying to learn more every day. But I thought to myself, you know what, if Solomon were the speaker of his day, how many people in Solomon's day were more highly educated than was he? He was as educated as any man of his day. And he knew it, and he said, I have gotten more wisdom than all before me in Jerusalem. My heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. I gave my heart, my full dedication in life was to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And he said, I've learned something. The more I learned, the more wise that I became, the more miserable I was when it came to that kind of earthly wisdom. And so look at chapter 2, verse 1. I said in mine heart, there we go again, Solomon, you're looking in all the wrong places for the answers to what your life is supposed to be all about. I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Ready? Therefore, enjoy pleasure. Solomon says, why did God put us here on this planet? To enjoy pleasures, whatever they are. I seek them. I experience them. I get up in the morning and my whole quest is please myself. I want to be pleased with my own pleasure and the, own, the decisions that I make, the pursuits of my flesh. And so, Solomon, how's that working for you? It's vanity. This also is vanity. It's, it's grasping for the wind. I've got it. I finally captured it. Open up your hand, Solomon, and show us what you captured. There's nothing there that's tangible. You thought you had something, but upon further review, there's nothing there. And so Solomon, what, I, I tried to laugh my way through life. Send in the clowns and make me laugh. Tickle my funny bone and let me just laugh my way through life. And what, did that good, what good did that do, he asks at the bottom of verse 2, Ecclesiastes 2.2. And so he said, I'll try alcohol. I'll try to titillate the senses with just enough uh, alcohol. I don't want to become someone that loses my sensibility altogether, but I do want to, and that didn't work for him either. So he became a workaholic. Verse 4, made great works, builded me houses. Some people have their dream house. Solomon had dream houses. And you think, oh, if I could ever live in that house that's up on that hill right there, I'd finally know the true meaning of life and happiness in life. Solomon says, I had a bunch of houses like that. And how's that working for you, Solomon? I, they were beautifully landscaped properties. I planted vineyards, verse 4, had gardens and orchards and pools to water the wood that brought forth the trees. And, oh, I've heard someone say this before, you know, if I had some servants that could just do whatever I wanted done the moment I wanted it done, and I could just kick back and relax, I'd finally be happy. Solomon had that. He had servants born to him in the house, had great possessions of great and small cattle. If I just had some, some savings to not have to worry financially, I'd be happy. Solomon says, okay, I've got some. In fact, I had so much money, if I saw something, verse 10, if my eyes desired it, I kept not, I, I purchased it. I didn't keep myself from it. I remember going to look for my first car. My dad said, here's our budget. Now, take a look. And nope, 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 nope. Wait a minute. And I was going to be working to pay off, but he was making a down payment to help me, but I was going to pay the, the monthly payments, but... Uh, he said, here's your budget. I found one that was older, but still in good shape. And I remember thinking, wow, can you imagine having the money to come and buy any car off the lot you want? Boy, wouldn't that be finally the happiest day of your life? And then I drove by a junkyard. 
and I looked out in that field and I saw car after car after car after car after car and guess what? Every one of those cars in the junkyard used to be someone's brand new ride. And so what is the purpose of life? It's, it's not to accumulate some stuff and to get some more things. Solomon, what did you conclude after you looked on everything you'd accumulated? Verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 2. I looked on all the works my hands had wrought, the labor I'd labored to do. It was all vanity, vexation of spirit, grasping for the wind. There's no profit under the sun. In fact, if you really want to know what Solomon's view was, he says, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And what would you put on the t-shirt, Solomon? I hated life. Look at verse 17. Ecclesiastes 2.17. Therefore, I hated life. Elvis Presley, are you happy? He told a magazine reporter, in an interview, he said, sometimes I believe that I'm the most miserable man on earth. <laughs> now, he's giving this interview in his mansion at Graceland. And the reporter's looking around at all the, the gold and platinum records on the wall. And they're in a 20-plus room house, a mansion. And just outside that mansion, there's the, the pool that Elvis can enjoy and there of course not far there's a limousine waiting outside to whisk him away wherever he wants to go in style and it can take him to his plane where he can get on board that plane his own private plane and fly anywhere in the world he wants to fly and if anyone finds out he's leaving oh I'm telling you the beautiful ladies will be waiting outside to wave at him and hope that he looks at them so oh, Elvis a lot of people would love to be as miserable as are you you're miserable you Elvis Presley are the most miserable man on earth come on the reporter kept trying to get him to take it back he wouldn't how do I know this I preached a story about that interview and I preached a sermon actually from first Timothy chapter 6 where Paul would tell Timothy we brought nothing into this world verse 7 of first Timothy 6 and it's certain we can carry nothing out and the love of money that many have coveted after has pierced themselves through with many sorrows, verses 10 and 11. And I was preaching about that subject in 1 Timothy 6, and I told this story. And then Tuesday night, I went to visit a couple that had been at our services that Sunday morning. And they were very enthusiastic to see me at their door. In fact, they welcomed me on in. And they said, we had not been to church in 17 years. And the first Sunday we went back to church... You preached on Elvis. Wasn't that amazing? <laughs> yes, it was amazing to me because I didn't think I'd preached on Elvis. I, I told one story about him in the exegesis of 1 Timothy 6, 7 to 17, but that was their take on it. I said, well, why did it surprise you so much that I mentioned that story? And she spoke up and she said, well, Gene here, he's Elvis's first cousin. His mother and Elvis's mother were sisters and I married into the family, and we used to live at Graceland upstairs. Can I be honest with you and tell you that my first reaction when this lady, whom I'd never met before, was telling me these things, in my mind, I was thinking, what kind of Looney Tunes have I run into here <laughs> that, bless their hearts, think they lived with Elvis at Elvis's house? Come on. And then they pull out the photo albums. Yes, here we are on the set of this movie with Elvis. And here we are at the holiday party with Elvis. And here we are. With... And this is long before the days of Photoshop. And I'm stammering and stuttering and backpedaling in my mind. And I'm... I realize they're telling me the truth. And then Gene said, you really took me down memory lane Sunday morning. I said, how is that? He said... You know that interview you mentioned? I said, yes, sir. He said, I was in the room when it was conducted. He said, Elvis would allow us to sit there as long as we didn't interfere. He'd allow us to just observe and listen. And he said, when Elvis told that man, he was sometimes thought he was the most miserable man on earth. You've never seen a, an incredulous look on the face like this man had. It was, you, sir, surely you, you don't mean that. He tried every way. He'd come to write a puff piece about how great it would be to be Elvis Presley, the dream of every American male. 
And Elvis is sitting there saying, you know what? I'm miserable. So there must be something more to life than getting some stuff and getting some fame and fortune. Solomon, could you have saved men like Elvis and just start naming the Hollywood celebrity stories you've seen on television, true stories of Hollywood celebrities, and how many of them ended up in this miserable path? They had the nicest house in the community. They had the nicest wardrobe, the most fancy cars, plural, and they could have had anything they wanted pretty much as far as purchasing any item, and yet so many of them are looking for something to give meaning to their lives. So did God ever give us a meaning, and did Solomon ever figure out what it was? I'll tell you this, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, he said, I've learned this much. If you love silver, you're not going to be satisfied with silver. You're going to want gold. And so in Ecclesiastes 5.15, Solomon, what's your conclusion? As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. We leave empty-handed. And so if we don't live here on this planet just to get some stuff, because 2 Peter chapter 3 says that that stuff is all going to melt with fervent heat, the most prized possession you have, whether it's your home, your wardrobe, your phone, whatever it is, I can promise you this, someday when the Lord is ready to make his return, it's going to burn. It's going to burn up. And so then Peter asked this question in 2 Peter chapter 3 that I'd like to use as a springboard to the rest of this message. 2 Peter chapter 3, and notice the statement that is made in verse 11. 2 Peter 3.11, here it is. Seen then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God, when the heavens are going to be on fire, we're told, and be dissolved, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. But we are looking for a new dwelling place, he says, and we'll find it if we're found without spot and blameless before him, verse 14. So that raises this question. If this whole world's going to just burn up someday, and I may die before that ever happens, what is the purpose of my existence, and where could I go to find the answer? Well, the Barnes and Noble didn't have the book, or the attendant didn't think they had it, the book's a million attendant and doesn't. Let's go to the local library. Let's go to the university library. Surely there are plenty of books here. Can you take us to the one book in the university library that will say definitively how the world began, why the world began, and how it's all going to end. Take us to the one volume. I don't want to check out a dozen volumes on it. I want one volume, and I want it written by someone that was actually there when it started and who's going to be there at the end when it ends. Show me that author. Here he is, right here. Here's the one book, the one, go to the Library of Congress, and wherever you find a Bible, at the university library, at the bookstore, whenever you find a Bible that is the Word of God, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21, and all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, for a correction for instruction in righteousness. How do I know what's right, what's wrong? I don't have to wait for 35 to 40 people to come out of a room here on the campus and say, we figured out what's right and what's wrong. God already figured that out and gave it to mankind. They wrote it down, preserved it, and you and I have a copy of it. There you go. So why am I here? Solomon, did you ever figure, here we go. Solomon figured it out. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 13. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. I'm aware of the fact that the King James has an italicized word duty there. And it's not a bad word necessarily, but it's not a necessary word in this case 
because I can make perfect sense out of this passage by reading it this way. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. That's the whole essence of what it is to be man. To find out what God wants me to do and to reverence him and to do it. Do you know centuries later there would be an apostle named Peter who would be at the household of one named Cornelius and he would preach to him the sweet story of Jesus Christ and the cross that Jesus bore for you and me as a sinless sacrifice. And he went about doing good and then he died and then he rose. And guess what uh, we read in Acts 10, 34 and 35? In every nation... God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter what color you are, what educational status you possess. In every nation, he that, here it is. See if this sounds a lot like Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Fear God, keep his commandments. In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness. What is righteousness? Psalm 119, verse 172 all thy commandments are righteousness. To work righteousness is to work obedience to the commands of God written down by inspiration. I don't have to speculate what I'm supposed to do and look up in the stars and wonder if I can interpret what they mean or wait for a leaf to come falling down from a tree and cascade toward the ground and suddenly say, okay, now I get it. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus is the only one qualified to be my Savior. He bled and died on the cross for me after having lived a perfect life. He arose on the third day, and then he ascended and went into heaven. That's where he is right now until he comes back to take me home to either live with him or to say to me, depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And tell me, if I take the Bible... And I just get rid of it just for the sake of illustration. I act like there is no Bible. There is no word from God. Could I look out and see that someone made this? The evidence was striking. Very powerful. Someone did made this. They made this world. Someone made this universe. You would never have to convince any atheist in the world that these screens that are here and the PowerPoint projectors that are pointing at them were just the result of accidental chance and happenstance. There was deliberate design and purpose between, behind something as simple as that. And I guarantee you the camera that God gave you and me in your eyes and mine is even more sophisticated than anything that man has still been able to come up with. And so try to imagine this, an iPhone without a maker and the eyeball without a look. Stephen Hawking was mentioned in the last session. And one of his television programs, I don't know if he still has this intro or not, but one of his television programs uh, at the intro showed a camera at the very end of the intro zooming in on his eye. And I thought, I'm sure you didn't intend it, but you could not have given a better testament to the existence of God if you tried than to have them zoom in on your eye because your eye is a marvel indeed all by its lonesome. The one who made all of that, let's say that we figure out someone made this complex human body, the circulatory system in your body. Think about all the one tiny strand of your DNA is more complex than a cake. If a cake has to have a baker, man has to have a maker. So let me ask you, there is a God or there's a creator, there's someone, what now? Does he love me? Does he know I exist? Does he care I exist? Is there anything he wants me to do? Is there anything he doesn't want me to do? And I know he made everything, but what's next? If I die or if my loved one just died, do I have any assurance? Do I have any hope? Remember, the Bible, we put it away. We don't have a Bible. Well, I'll go to the library and I'll try to find one book that answers all these questions there. That's not the Bible, no. I can look and look and look and look and look until I'm blue, both in heart and in the face. But I can promise you this, the good news is I don't have to throw this away. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There are evidences that show you these men wrote what was beyond human production alone. 
Yes, men were involved in the writing of it, but miraculously inspired men. That's why I'm so grateful that Isaiah could tell me about the circle of the earth in Isaiah 40, centuries before that was commonly believed by man. I can read so many evidences in the scriptures of how the biblical writer was not setting out to write a science textbook, but wrote scientifically and accurately every time that he wrote something scientific. It was accurate. It was not some kind of, you know, just guess. It was inspired revelation from God. So with that said, now I don't have to jettison this book. I open it up and I say, okay, what, what am I supposed to do? I find out Jesus Christ actually came to this world to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. What does he want me to do? Except you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. He wants me to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's in the Bible. I read it in that passage in John chapter 8 and verse 24. What else does he want me to do? He's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17 and verse 30. Well, what would make me want to repent? The goodness of God leads me to repentance. Romans 2 and verse 4. Well, what goodness of God? I asked Jesus how much he loved me, and he stretched out his arm and said, this much, you've heard that before? You see him hanging there on the cross, bleeding and dying for you and for me, and I see the blood dripping from his head, his hands, his feet, and I see it pooling beneath his cross, and I think, what do you want from me, God? Whatever it is, I want to give it, because if you gave this for me, I want to give you whatever you want from me. What do you want? If you love me, keep my commandments. In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. I know what the commandments of God are. They're written down for me in Scripture. And I can know exactly what to do. And I can know this. Even when I've done all of them, I'm still going to be indebted to the grace and mercy of God to save me. I could never save myself by myself. How do I contact the cleansing blood of Christ? Well, what... Does God want from me? Well, on the day of Pentecost, did you know there were some folks who essentially asked that question? Okay, now that we know Jesus really is the Messiah, the Christ, what does God want from us? What shall we do in response to having killed him, having put him to death? What shall we do? Incidentally, this would have been the perfect time if this were God's plan of salvation. This would have been the perfect time for the inspired apostle to say what you often see said on television, for him to say, well, everyone bow your heads and say this prayer, and I will lead you in this prayer, the sinner's prayer, and you can ask Jesus to come into your heart and make you the Lord of your, make him the Lord of your life. I'm going to lead you in that prayer now. Everyone bow your head, and I'll lead you that. He could have said that, but he didn't. What did he say? What does God want from me? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Saul of Tarsus, do you now believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You've been persecuting those who do believe that. I, I've seen him on the, Lord, on the road to Damascus, rather, and yes, I believe. I believe he's the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? What would you have me to do? You go into the city. And you wait there, and it will be told thee what thou must do. Acts 9, 6. So God gets a hold of a preacher named Ananias, an inspired man. He says, I want you to go, and uh, I want you to tell him what to do. So he, and then he told him this, by the way. He says, the man you're looking for, he prayeth. You're looking for a praying man. Perfect opportunity for an inspired preacher to say to a praying man, hey, You've been praying for all these days. Now let me teach you what to pray, and you can get your salvation. Pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart and make him the Lord of your life, and you'll be cleansed. Is that what he told the praying man to do? Ananias, the inspired preacher, told the praying man, get up. Arise, and these words are in your copy of God's Word. 
They're not coming from my own human wisdom. I didn't get them from a man-made creed book. I got them from this inspired word. Here we go. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how you do it. And so what does God want from me? He wants me to accept the fact that he sent his son as my sacrifice by hearing that message, believing it, repenting of my sins, confessing his sweet name as the eunuch did in Acts 8, and then being baptized for the remission of sins to wash away my sins in the blood of Christ and then to be simultaneously added to the church that belongs to Christ. And uh, maybe there's someone here that would love to study the Bible about that. Because, you know, I can promise you this as I start closing out my message before we take a few questions and answers, if you have any questions. I want to tell you this. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. And any man that tells you he does know that is not telling you the truth because Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. We don't know. I thought recently with the eclipse... There might be a reason why God didn't tell us the exact day he was coming back. Guess when I started looking for glasses for the day of the eclipse? Right at the very end, before it was almost there, I'm scrambling for glasses. Do you think if God had told us the exact day he was coming back, you'd have some folks waiting till the last minute to try to prepare for his arrival? He wants us to be ready all the time, to stay ready. And so here I'm, I'm going to look for His coming. I don't know when it's going to be, but I just want to stay ready. And if I die before He comes back, I want to be ready. Because I don't know when the day of my death's going to come. If I could be personal with you for just a moment about how this was driven home to me in very sudden fashion on March the 4th of 2016. My mother, who lived with me at the time, cried out and said, I can't breathe. And we went to try to help her breathe. And I asked her if she was having a panic attack. And she said, no, I'm dying. And I didn't know whether she was exaggerating that or, but within a couple of minutes, she slipped away. She was gone. And I want to ask you something. As hard, it is, hard as it is to talk about that, does this give me hope in talking about that, yes or no? And so if my mother had, had not known the Lord Jesus Christ, had not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, it would be much more difficult, but even if I have had a relative, and all of us have, I'm sure, that haven't obeyed the gospel, I know what I need to do, and I know that I need to be ready and serve Him and live for Him. Can I capture the meaning of life in one final illustration that may be familiar to you, but I think is always memorable to me? These parents bring their son in on the night of his high school graduation into the living room before they leave for the ceremony. And they said, we want to have a one final talk with you before we go. After you graduate tonight, what is next on life's agenda for you? He looked a little puzzled by the question because his mom and dad knew what was next. But they said, humorous, just talk it through with us, okay? What's next? Uh... I'll go to college. That's what's next. You all know I'm going to college. Okay. Let's say you live long enough to go through all four years of college. Then what's next? I, I go out and start my career. Maybe I get married and start my family. Okay, good. We are looking forward to finding just the right person. And yes, the grandchildren, that'll be sweet. All right, then what's next? What comes after that? I raised the children, and uh, I advanced myself at work to try to provide for the family that I have. Okay, good. We want to see you succeed, and we're looking forward to enjoying your fruits of labors and success. Okay, let's say you live long enough to begin that process. Then what? Well, I guess my children will be graduating from high school, and I'll watch them graduate, and they'll go off to college, and they'll start their careers with their families. Well, that means... Great, that means grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Okay, we, we can handle that, yes. 
All right, let's say you live long enough to retire from your job with your children already grown and married, having children, you're retired, then what? What comes next? After retirement, what's next? I enjoy retirement. Okay, good. We're probably not going to be around to enjoy your retirement years with you, but let's say you get to retire. You live long enough to retire. What's next? I enjoy retirement. I mean, I sleep in. If I want to sleep in, I get up. If I want to get up, I go where I want to go. I, I guess that's what. Okay, how long will that last? What comes after retirement, son? What's next? Well, I mean, I guess eventually... I guess I'll, I'll die. With tears in his eyes, the father looks at him and says, yes, son, you will. We all will. But what comes next after that? What's next? Friends, this series of lessons this afternoon it's all about getting ready for the what's next. And it starts with God. Figure out that he's, he actually exists. Okay, now that I know he actually exists, what does he want me to do with my existence? He wants me to live in such a way that I get to eternally exist with him someday by his side in heaven above. I get to go and be there forevermore. That's what's God wants to be what's next. The other what's next, you don't want to know about that. You don't want to experience that. The, the rich man did, and it's not pleasant. And so why not live for not the here and the now, but the then and the there? Because where you go hereafter will depend on what you go after here. Let's make sure we go after the right things and fulfill our purpose to fulfill his commandments. Brother Clark was uh, in Sevierville, Tennessee this past week attending an event called Polishing the Pulpit. Uh, I think they about wore him out there. They, they tried to get all the good out of him, but they failed because we have just heard an extremely fine gospel sermon. Uh, not only that, but school started back yesterday, and he was in Farmington, Missouri this morning at a lectureship speaking there, and this afternoon he is with us. I, I told you all of that to say this. You don't have to stop preaching. <laughs> no, we, you can come back over here, and I go sit back down, and you can continue. Thank you very much for what you said. I, I want to say this before we get into the question and answer uh, part of this particular hour. Uh, I should have said it before, but I'm glad I did not because it would have taken away your diligent note-taking. DVDs of today are going to be made available. Those will be through the website of the Nettleton Church of Christ. In addition to the DVDs being made available, it's also going to be available online uh, through YouTube and other platforms on the Internet. So it's being recorded, and those recordings will be made available to you if you want one. Now, having said that, are there, there are questions? I'm going to step out of the way and allow Brother Clark to come back over here. He uh, will recognize uh, anyone who has a question and and if if you guys don't i i have some <laughs> i have some myself so i've been handed uh, some written questions let me try to navigate through these rather quickly uh number one how can re we rely on the scriptures being infallible and absolute uh, and the answer to that is to test them and to see what they're made of you know when some, a chemist wants to know what kind of a, a solution he's working with. He can do a test to determine its contents. 
And you know, the Bible does not fear investigation. You can study this book right here and you can see how, as Brother Miller alluded to earlier, men from different cultures over time were able to, to give a completely harmonious picture. I remember hearing the illustration, if you sent 35 to 40 people off in a room and said, okay, paint something. And then when you finish, whatever it is, you just paint whatever you want. And when you finish, bring it all out. We'll lay them all down side by side and make a picture. You know as well as I do that uh, there'd be a good chance that because of the randomness of what people were painting in various places without corroboration, we might not be able to get those things to mesh together very well. But here's the beauty of the biblical record. Though these men were separated by centuries, by different occupations, by all kinds of cultural challenges, they were able to write down in each their own time as led by the Holy Spirit, a message that when put side by side with the rest of what was written makes a beautiful picture and shows the unanimity of, of the authorship of the Bible being the Holy Spirit, uh, the unity of, of that. And then you look at the, the things that were mentioned earlier. And by the way, I would encourage you to go to sites like Apologetics Press for evidences on how we know the Bible uh, proves itself to be beyond human production alone. It, uh, there's so many evidences of scientific foreknowledge, et cetera, uh, and you can just, you can go through and find them. Uh, they're abundant, believe me. God did not leave us without witness about the, resp the uh, integrity of his word. Here's a question. Uh, why are there so many denominations and how can we know which church is right? Is it Methodist, Catholic, Baptist, et cetera? Uh, my answer to that would be to not give my answer uh, from my own pool of wisdom, but to draw your minds back to the New Testament day of Pentecost, and thousands are gathered, and the sermon is preached, and the Bible says that they ask, what shall we do? And they were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, told they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did anyone respond favorably to that command, yes or no? About 3,000, yes. Gladly welcomed the word and were baptized and were added. Added to, to what? Acts 2.47 in your Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Which one? To really try to put you in the perspective of how we need to view this I'd like you to imagine that we could travel back in time, just for the sake of illustration, imagine that we could travel back to the day of Pentecost. We see the 3,000, almost 3,000 or about 3,000 dripping wet folks who are excited. They've got a smile on their faces. What is, what is the basis of your joy? My sins have been washed away by the blood of Christ, and I'm now a member of the church. Now, we're from 2017. Let's say this is Acts 2 and that this is 2017. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, how many churches did Jesus build on that day and start and bring into existence on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2? How many? One. When those people obeyed the gospel, were they members of that church that day that started that day, yes or no? Whose church was that? Well, who bought it with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28? Who said, upon this rock I will build my church? Now, if it's his church, doesn't it need to wear his name? Isn't he the one that purchased it? I know that you've heard this before, but it just works. It still needs to be heard by those who may not have heard it before. Suppose on the day of your wedding, your bride announces to you, she won't be wearing your last name after the marriage. She'll be wearing uh, the last name of the best man who is not your brother. or <laughs> He doesn't have the same last name as you. It's just a friend from college. And she says, I like his name better. I'm going to wear his last name. Would you say, that's fine, I don't care? Or would you say, well, no, no, no. You're not marrying him. You're marrying me. You're, you, you are mine and I am yours. We're both each other's. Look, the Lord was the one who bought the church with his blood. Why would we want to name it after anyone who didn't die for it? Why would we want to designate it by any 
other way except to say it is his. And so on the day of Pentecost, we call one of those people over and say, hey, you're so happy. Are you, uh, are you happy because you're a member of the church? Yes. W which one? Which one are you? A me which denomination are you? In our day and time, if we ask someone which denomination, they kind of see what we're asking because they've seen the church on that corner, that corner, that corner, and that corner. They're answering from a 2017 vantage point. How would the people on Pentecost have answered the question, which denomination are you? They didn't know anything about denominationalism such as you and I know about it. But did they know about a church, yes or no? And did they know who that church belonged to? Yes. And when Paul wrote Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you, did he know to whom the church belonged? Yes, it was the church that belonged to Christ. Now, I think there's been a, an unfortunate misunderstanding, and that is that some over the years have thought that we were saying this, and we're not saying this. Of all the denominations that exist today, there's one denomination that's better than any of the others. And that's the Church of Christ denomination. We're the best one of them all. I've never believed that, never taught that. In fact, I was having a Bible study with a couple some years ago, and when I was studying Acts 2 with them and made the point I just made to you, I was ready to move on, and the, the lady wouldn't let me. She said, wait, wait, wait. You're not asking us to, to leave our denomination we've grown up in to join your denomination you've grown up in, like yours is better. If I'm hearing you right, when you say become a member of the church of Christ, you mean the same church of Christ these people in Acts 2 became members of? That church of Christ? That's the one you're trying to get us to become members of? What would you have said to her? Yes, ma'am. That's the one. The only one I want anything to do with. And she said, well, then shall we go to the pond? I'm ready right now to become a member of that church. And why, why did she want to be baptized? Is it essential to salvation? That's another question that's been given here today. And what's the only way you and I could know that? Go to the books of Holy Scripture God has given us. This isn't something where I'm trying to go by my own think-sos or some catechism or creed written by uninspired men. I turn to the inspired Word of God. I see Jesus' own words, He that believeth. And something, he that believeth and, and what? He that believeth and is baptized shall be something, shall be what? Shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. And Peter, did you insist on the necessity of baptism for the remission of sins when you were asked what to do? I said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And Peter, did you write later in one of your epistles anything about baptism and salvation? Yes. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now something. Baptism does also now something. What does the inspired word of God say that baptism also now does, not by the water, but by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? 1 Peter 3.21. What does it do? Baptism does also now save us. That's in the Bible, 1 Peter 3.21. And then the last question I have written here is the doctrine of once saved, always saved, a biblical doctrine. Certainly it is biblical to say that God wants us once saved, always saved, that he certainly can give us eternal security, and he's promised it to us if... John 10, 27 and 28, here's what he says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them, them, the sheep that hear my voice and follow me, I give unto those sheep, he says, eternal life, and they shall, who shall never perish? They hear my voice, they follow me. And in the original language, the tenses are, they keep on hearing my voice, they keep on following me. And as long as we keep on hearing his voice and keep on following him, we keep on having eternal security. Not because we're so great and we deserve salvation, but because we love his blood and his gifts so much, we want to keep on doing what he says do. We want to keep on listening and following that person has eternal security. But my friends, Acts 8 tells us about Simon the sorcerer who believed and was baptized. Now we just saw this in Mark 16, 16. 
He that believeth and something is baptized shall be something. What shall he be? Saved. Acts 8, 13. Then Simon himself also believed and was baptized. Now, if he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and Simon believed and was baptized, then he was saved. But after that, you see him wanting to buy the gift of God with money and trying to purchase it with his own funds. And uh, he was told to repent of his wickedness, that his heart was not right in the sight of God. Thy money, watch this, perish with thee. I thought he was saved. Well, he was. But by his choice that he's made, he is now in a position where he needs to be forgiven again. And he can be. He's told, repent and pray that the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. So I believe in eternal security for those who are willing to find it God's way. Uh, there are 2,500 passages plus in the Bible which show that you could lose your salvation if you chose to. But there is also a beautiful text in 1 John 5, 13 that says you can know that you're saved and you don't have to live in fear and doubt. You can have blessed assurance. Now those are the written questions that I have. Is there any other written question or would someone in the audience have a question that they would like to ask? Yes. Right. Uh, you read Acts chapter 8, and it says that, um, for as yet uh, the Spirit had fallen upon none of them. And uh, this is a, a matter of, of discussion for some, some brethren who believe that when you're baptized, you receive a, a non-miraculous, ordinary measure of the Spirit to indwell you. Uh, and others have taken the position that the Spirit does indwell you, but does so insofar as the Word indwells you. And brethren from those camps can get along and get along fine as long as they don't start arguing for the miraculous. Uh, I started out believing, uh, just personal uh, observation here, I started out believing, in fact I called my dad, I'd read a book, I said I didn't know the Holy Spirit was living inside of me, and he said, well read another book just to compare the Bible to it, but then look at your conclusions, and he didn't try to tell me what to believe. But I studied it in my, in my own uh, persuasion was that Acts 8 was uh, an interesting passage because it shows that if the Spirit had not yet fallen upon them, then they had not received any uh, uh, measure of the Spirit at their baptism. But they did need the laying on of hands. Why did they need the laying on of hands in that day and time when we don't today? They didn't have this written down, confirmed, completed uh, bound and put in one copy. How did they prove back? How did I prove today that something is really from God with chapter and verse following, book chapter and verse following? How did they prove that something was really from God? They were claiming. They didn't say turn in your Bibles or turn your Bibles to because they couldn't do that with the entirety of the Bible. And not everyone had a personal copy even for the books that were already written. So they would do that with signs following and prove they were credible messengers of God. But once God took the miraculous out of the way, it's like the scaffolding that built this building. Once this building is built, what do you do with the scaffolding? You take it down, it's no longer needed, and you're able to uh, find everything that pertains to life and godliness in this book. I don't need a direct operation of the Holy Spirit to inform me of anything that God wants me to know that's already right here. Now, some might believe the Spirit is... Uh, dwelling in them in a non-miraculous way and not giving them any information you can't get from here. And I wouldn't fall out with them even if I didn't take the same position. But uh, that, that answers hopefully your, your question about Acts 8 and why he had not yet fallen upon them. Other questions? Any questions related to purpose and meaning and why we're here? Be glad to hear from you or not at all. Doesn't matter. Let me just say this as I close out my comments then. Um, I saw a factoid at a movie theater years ago that concerns me. It said, did you know the average running time of movies today is 30 minutes longer than movies of 50 years ago? What concerned me more about that is not that the movies are getting longer, 
I was sitting there in the theater thinking, okay, the average sermon today, would the average sermon today be longer or shorter than a sermon from 50 years ago? Shorter for sure, right? Now the movies are getting longer, the sermons are getting shorter, and the world is getting... Is there any connection between this... Uh, is that one of the reasons why are we getting more air, is Satan getting more airtime than God is? And don't get me wrong, I love a, a good clean flick when I can find one. I love to go to the football game, and I'm, I'm grateful college football is almost back. I love watching it. But I want you to know that the most important thing that's going to matter on the day of judgment is not how my team did or how the movie ended, but how my life ends. Yes. Can you tell me the difference in the baptism in Acts two thirty eight? Mm-hmm. In the baptism in Mark sixteen sixteen. Is there a difference in them two? Okay, he's asking if there's a difference between the baptism of Acts two thirty eight and the baptism of Mark sixteen sixteen. There's definitely no difference in their purpose because Mark sixteen sixteen, he that believeth and is baptized, what? Shall be saved. What's the baptism of Acts 2.38 for? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Take shall be saved and for the remission of sins and put them side by side and they are equivalent. They mean the same thing. So to be baptized to be saved and to be baptized for the remission of sins would be the same thing. And that is why Peter, the same man that said what he said in Acts 2.38, would say, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, certainly Peter knew. In fact, I'll say this real quickly. Acts 2.21 and Acts 2.38 are great side-by-side -side companions. Because what does Peter say in Acts 2.21? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. And then to that same audience he says... Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, it shall be saved of verse 21 and remission of sins in verse 38. Are those equal to the same thing? Yes. So how do you call on the name of the Lord so that you shall be saved? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's how you call. And I know it because a praying man named Saul of Tarsus was told by an inspired preacher while he was praying, get up. Get up for what purpose? Arise and, what does your Bible say? This isn't B.J. Clark saying this. This is your, the Word of God. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how you call on the name of the Lord and how God does the work that he does through the blood of his Son. Sure, yes, sir. When I'm trying to teach somebody, I teach them that baptism and the other baptism. You see the gift of the Holy Spirit in one, and you don't the other. Okay, well, this gets back to, I see what you're saying. The Mark 16, 17 follows Mark 16, 16. And Mark 16, 17 says, These signs shall follow them that believe. And it talks about the miraculous gifts that they would be doing, that they would be uh, working Miraculous, the Lord be working with them, confirming the word with signs following. And so that is one of the reasons why I ended up changing my personal position. I'm not binding this on anyone. This is not a, a matter of salvation like baptism for the remission of sins is. But I think the evidence to me is uh, best for uh, Acts 2.38 is a promise to first sentence. Now think about it. Here you are, your first century believer. You're standing there, your first century person standing there on the day of Pentecost. Everything you've seen that day to that point regarding the Holy Spirit is what? Miraculous or non-miraculous? Miraculous. Miraculous for sure. And then when he says you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, what did they know? What information had they received about any non-miraculous measure of the indwelling Spirit? I do believe the Spirit indwells us, but I don't believe the indwelling is equivalent to the gift. Here's what I believe. When those people were about to go home, 
Uh, they actually ended up staying around longer than they ever planned. But when they went home to their home, and they scattered abroad preaching the word, how would they prove to people that what they were saying was really from God? There's one way with signs following. Where would they get those miraculous abilities? The apostles were right there on the day of Pentecost. They could baptize them, empower them with the ability to do those gifts, and thus confirm the word with signs following. And thus, I believe Mark 16, 17, and following is the equivalent of the gift of the Spirit in Acts 2, 38. I believe that they both teach salvation, and they both teach miraculous gifts to follow for the first century believers. That would be my personal understanding of it. Um, I don't. I don't bind it. Um, I, you know, I. I. I know too many good brethren who take a non-miraculous indwelling view that don't go too far with it. And I would never. Brother Gus Nichols and Guy and Woods, <laughs> uh, preachers of yesteryear, used to debate this every year at the open forum in Freed Hardeman. And it was always good natured. No one got angry. And uh, I think we can do the same and carry on that tradition uh, today. And. Uh, I tell you, I didn't start out with this view, but I came to it, and uh, the evidence, I think, is there, but I certainly understand that people have to have the time to look through it and study it, and I'll keep studying it myself. I sure will. Yes, sir.